Hi guys! So Blaine and I um, are here to attempt to discuss and explain about entoptic phenomena. What is actually entoptic phenomena by the way? So entoptic phenomena are basically visual phenomena arising from within the eye, marked by the perception of floating bodies, circle of light, black spots, and transient flashes of light. But I'm not going to dwell more on the definition of entoptic phenomena because I think the other group already explained it fairly well. So like what I've mentioned, um, Blaine and I are here to show you some procedures and how to observe these phenomena. So without any further ado, here it goes. Enjoy! Okay, here you'll find a list of techniques scientists have described for seeing inside your eye with that same eye. The oldest technique involves using a point light source to see clear shadows of floaters in your eye and any spot you might have in the lens of your eye. Now in this video, Blaine and I will attempt to demonstrate a number of ways to do this while reviewing the history and explaining some of the science. The other techniques allow you to see blood moving in capillaries on the retina, shadows of the blood vessels on the retina, nerve activity on the retina, and the back of the eye. Now let's tackle the first and the oldest technique for seeing inside your own eye with that same eye, starting with a little science history. Now German astronomer Johannes Kepler published a book on optics in 1604 in which he stated that our eyes function by focusing an image onto the back of the eye. The physicist and astronomer Christoph Scheiner proved Kepler was right by removing most of the tissue from the back of an actual eye and looking at the focused images. Then, in 1674, the French mathematician Claude Francois de Chalet described how a nearsighted person or someone holding a magnifying lens in front of their eye can see the shadows of defects in the eye in the unfocused image of a distant light source. It was later discovered that looking at the brightly lit surface through a pinhole in a card held close to the eye served the same purpose, as well as other lens arrangement and looking closely at the reflection of a distant light in a tiny drop of mercury and black felt. Now let us explain how these various methods work and also demonstrate these and some other variations. Now, light rays from a sufficiently distant and small source arrive at the eye almost parallel. The light can be a candle like De Chalet used or something like a triple A mini mag light in candle mode. Now, the cornea and the lens of the eye refract this light to focus it to a point onto the retina. But in a nearsighted person, this light will be focused to a point in front of the retina, then it will spread out on the retina. It will appear as a disc because its shape is determined by the shape of the opening in the iris which is round in humans. Not only does the border of the iris cast shadow, but so does whatever might be in the path of the light, like a dark spot in the lens of the eye. Now you can also use a concave lens, perhaps one from your mom's trial case, to create an unfocused image of a distant light on your retina. Um, you can also use the tines of a fork held to reflect light, like what Blaine is doing here. What you're actually doing is basically creating a virtual image of the distant light. This image is functionally the same as a tiny light source held too close to your eye for you to focus on. You can also create a real image using a magnifying lens. However, using a mirror or lens has the disadvantage that you will see any imperfections in the mirror or lens as shadows, along with the shadows of things on or in your eye. The best thing to do is to simply create a point source of light that can be held close to your eye. Now, one of the easiest ways to do this is to crumple up some aluminum foil, like what Blaine is doing here. And it's taking her quite a while to do the uncrumpling. Then she should flatten it out. Okay, don't fret if that happens. Just get the bigger portion, you know, big enough to put it over a flashlight. And you will notice numerous tiny holes. Now put a piece of matte finished cellophane tape over some of the holes to diffuse the light. Then... 
Hold the light close to your eye. Okay, the smallest holes will make the clearest shadows, but they will also be dimmer. If you don't have a flashlight handy, you can hold the foil close to your eye and face a bright light. If you don't have a matte finished cellophane tape, instead of facing a light, just face a brightly lit white surface like a blank computer screen, probably a white wall or a day daytime sky. Remember, the disk of light you see is defined by the shadow of your iris and not by the shape of the hole or the light itself. The disk will get bigger as you move the light closer and smaller as you move it farther away. So, here, if you move your head from side to side or up and down like what Blaine is doing while holding the light steady, you should see shadows of things floating back and forth in your eye. Have you seen those? It may look like a tiny worm or a transparent blob, and whenever you try to get a closer look, it disappears, only to reappear as soon as you shift your glance. But don't go rinsing out your eyes. What you are seeing is a common phenomenon known as a floater. The scientific name for these object is Muscae volitantes, Latin for flying flies, and true to their name, they can be somewhat annoying but they're not actually bugs or any kind of external objects at all. Rather, they exist inside your eyeball. Floaters may seem to be alive since they move and change shape, but they're not alive. Floaters are tiny objects that cast shadows on the retina, the light-sensitive tissue at the back of your eye. They might be bits of tissue, red blood cells, or clumps of protein. Um, because they're suspended within the vitreous humor, the gel-like liquid that fills the inside of your eye, floaters drift along with your eye movements and seem to bounce a little when your eye stops. Floaters may be only barely distinguishable most of the time. They become more visible the closer they are to the retina. Just as holding your hand closer to a table with an overhead light will result in a more sharply defined shadow. And floaters are particularly noticeable when you are looking at a uniform bright surface like a blank computer screen, snow, or a clear sky, where the consistency of the background makes them easier to distinguish. The brighter the light is, the more your pupil contracts. This is an effect similar to replacing a large diffuse light fixture with a single overhead light bulb, which also makes the shadow appear clearer. The Swiss ophthalmologist and researcher Hans Goldman explained in a lecture in 1960 how the vitreous humor in the eye changes over time, resulting in floaters. There is another visual phenomenon that looks similar to floaters, but is in fact unrelated. If you've seen tiny dots of light darting about when looking at a bright blue sky, you've experienced what is known as the blue field and toptic phenomenon. In some ways, this is the opposite of seeing floaters. Here, you're not seeing shadows, but little moving windows letting light through to your retina. The windows are actually caused by white blood cells moving through the capillaries along your retina surface. These leukocytes can be so large that they nearly fill a capillary, causing a plasma space to open up in front of them. Because the space and the white blood cells are both more transparent to blue light than the red blood cells normally present in capillaries, we see a moving dot of light wherever this happens, following the paths of your capillaries and moving in time with your pulse. Under ideal viewing conditions, you might even see what looks like a dark tail following the dot. This is the red blood cells that have bunched up behind the leukocyte. Some science museums have exhibit which consists of a screen of blue light, allowing you to see these blue sky sprites much more clearly than you normally would. Although it had been written about previously, the first person who unambiguously described the in and investigated blue field and toptic phenomenon was the German doctor Johann Steinbuch in 1813. Steinbuch had seen the blood flow in capillaries in the webbed kin of frogs through a microscope so when he saw specks of light moving about while looking at a sunlit white wall he surmised that it was the blood moving through the capillaries on his own retina he wrote that he also saw the phenomenon while looking at the blue sky now in 1819 the Zeck researcher Johannes Porquinier suggested exerting yourself and then looking at the bright surface such as a snowfield 
He drew a simple diagram to show the movement of the blood cells. One century later, a biographer drew another simple figure in which he added the paths the blood cells seem to follow. And then the actual network of capillaries on the retina is much more intricate as this anatomical drawing from 1881 shows. And this detailed drawing with exaggerated vests Vessels was done by the Dr. William Iris on his very own capillaries. Now, to see the shadows of the capillaries on your own retina, just poke a hole in a card and then phase a bright surface and rapidly rotate the hole in front of your eye, like what Blaine is doing here right now. In doing that, have you ever seen a glimpse of branching lines in your vision? Perhaps while your optometrist was shining a light in your eye, what you saw might have been the shadows of blood vessels on the surface of your retina. Blaine and I will describe some of the history and science of this phenomenon and show how to get remarkably stable and detailed view. We will also briefly describe two other phenomena. In 1819, the Zec physician Johannes Porquinier described moving a candle in peripheral view of his eye and seeing the shadows of the major blood vessels on the retina. Now, in place of a candle, we suggest to use a AAA mini mag light in candle mode. Do this in a dimly lit room facing a blank wall. Hold the hand over one eye and stare directly ahead with your other eye while moving the light in arcs or circles in your peripheral vision. You should see a branching figure which rapidly fades from view if you stop moving the light. Now, in 1825, Bourquignet published a variation of his original method in which he focused a spot of sunlight into the white of the eye and a safer way of doing this is to hold a white lead against the corner of your closed eyes and move the light in small circles. So why do we see these shadows at all and why do they fade? Porquinier did not answer these questions but in 1830 the English scientist Charles Wheatson in a review of Porquinier's work noted that blood vessels are semi-transparent and suggested that Normally, the photoreceptors on the retina adjust for the decreased light level underneath the vessels. But when the shadows move, the photoreceptors requires a little time to readjust. You can easily see that your flesh is translucent, so it is reasonable to believe that a very thin layer, blood vessels included, would be transparent. But why would the shadow of the semi-transparent blood vessels fade out but not the image of something you are looking at as it stays focused on one location on the retina? The answer is both fade when they don't move. It is just that normally the vessel shadows don't move and normally the focused images do move. This is because our eyes are constantly making small movement called micro saccades. These movements are why we experience some visual illusions as moving. We simply can keep our eyes still enough. If we could keep our eyes perfectly still, so even the focused image of something we were looking at did not move on the retina, the image would fade. We would go blind. However, you can easily keep your eyes still enough to experience the disappearance of this large fuzzy ring in your peripheral vision by looking sadly at the central red dot. Because of the ring's fuzzy edges and our lack of peripheral equity, the micro saccades our eyes make automatically are not enough to keep the image of the ring from fading. This is called the Troxler fading after the Swiss physician Ignaz Troxler who wrote about this phenomenon in 1804. While everybody's eyes experience these sorts of effects, the number and type vary greatly. In the case of floaters, for example, they often go unnoticed, as our brain learns to ignore them. However, abnormally numerous or large floaters that interfere with vision may be a sign of a more serious condition, requiring immediate medical treatment. But the majority of the time, entoptic phenomena such as floaters and blue sky sprites are just a gentle reminder that what we think we see depends just as much on our biology and minds as it does on the external world.